Isaiah chapter 50. That's in your Bible right after Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 50 and verse 9 is what I'll call your attention to as we get underway. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all, as my enemies, shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. The Bible has plenty to say about the house moth. And this title will naturally be the moth-eaten garment. That expression has its origin in the Word of God. This won't be a lengthy sermon either, by the way, so you can be relieved. In Job 4, verse 19, he compares the pride and the presumption of angels who think that they are as just and wise as God with men, quote, that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. Also in Job 13, verses 26 to 28, he talks about the consequences of sin in your youth, making your life like a moth-eaten garment when you get older. The Apostle James, warning the rich man about trusting in his wealth, declares, quote, Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. James 5, verse 2. Recall what the Lord Jesus preached, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. And he adds, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Lord Jesus compared the work of the moth to that of a thief. A thief will break into your home or your property unannounced, uninvited, and steal something of value to you. Likewise, the moth will come into your house, get into your closet, unannounced, uninvited, and destroy some expensive garment you have. Uh, in our text, Isaiah 50, verse 9, the wicked are compared to a garment that will wax old like one that is moth-eaten by the Lord's judgment one day. Then he says again, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool, but my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Isaiah 51, verse 8. The Lord draws a, a distinction between sin and salvation, and the destructive work of the moth is likened unto sin. You know something? There's... There's no power on earth that can destroy sin except salvation, right? And um, like a moth will consume a garment, sin will consume the man if it's not addressed. The prophets and the Lord Jesus and the apostles all understood the, the corrosive, the destructive, ruinous um, power of the moth. And they likened it to sin. It was a picture of sin. So let me consider what I call the moth-eaten garment. The moth-eaten garment. First of all, let me say this. The moth is a little insect. Its smallness, however, doesn't make it any less destructive. In fact, if it were larger, you might see it and be able to, to defend against it and keep it from doing its damage. You don't notice it's even come in until you discover some dress or some coat that's been ruined by it until later on. And sin can do the same thing in your life. Sin can do the same thing in the life of any man or woman, and even in the life of a Christian, even in the life of a believer. Uh, you start hanging around the wrong people, you start going to the wrong places, you start listening to the wrong voices, and it'll turn you into a practical atheist. You know that? It really will. And if you're saved, your life can become worthless to God, 
because you let just a little bit of sin in. It doesn't have to be a big sin. be a little one and festers and grows uh, until it's, it destroys you. The good testimony you might have had uh, has turned in your life into a moth-eaten garment in the eyes of God because of sin. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Until you address the issue of sin, either as a Christian or still a non-Christian, God is under no obligation to listen and hear and answer your prayers. You know that? None whatsoever. You have to come to him on his terms. The Bible states, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Proverbs 28, verse 13. You want to get rid of the moth of sin in your life. The experts say that the moth doesn't actually chew on the fabric. Its mouth isn't made to do that. But the females lay their eggs, their larvae, and... That turns uh, keratin into the substance of their body, the fuel or the food that causes their bodies to take shape, kind of like a, a bird's feather or a fingernail. And, uh, and as, that, as that process happens, that it's like a small little, like an acid resulting from those eggs and burns right through the, right through the clothing. So in that sense, it does eat through the clothing. So a moth-eaten garment is a perfectly uh, accurate description. The tiny eggs can destroy the item. And a little unchecked sin can destroy the man or the woman. Satan wants you to think you have it all under control. He wants you to think you, you've got a handle on it. You know when to say when. You know when to stop. You know when to change your mind. You, you know when to turn around. Think of how many broken homes, how many broken hearts... How many ruined reputations, how many lost jobs, how many lost opportunities, how many prison sentences have been served out because uh, as, a re as a result of someone's sin, thinking they had it under control. Yeah. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth, James 3 verse 5 st says. You know, one discarded match out your car window can burn down 50,000 acres in a forest fire. We were coming down from our church camp one year, several years back, we were in Big Bear. And uh, some of you might have driven down the same highway that Sunday morning that I did. And off to the left, there was a sign, had a picture of a car driver throwing his cigarette butt out the window. And the slogan simply read, one careless moment. You do a lot of damage with that. And just like the moth, sin is a little thing. Secondly, let me say this. The moth works quietly in secret. Once the females lay their eggs, they try to stay away from the direct sunlight while they burrow into the fabric. The Bible says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Proverbs 4, verses 18 and 19. They don't even realize what they're doing to themselves. The Bible says, Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. John 3, verse 19. And John 3, verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus. To reprove means to expose something in hopes of making it right once again. But people don't want to hang around the light. They don't want to be shown the light. They don't want to... You know, when you're trying to engage in sin, when you're trying to get away with something that would be less than noble and less than honorable in the eyes of Jesus Christ, you're not going to be reading your Bible. You're not going to be praying. You're not going to be concerned with the welfare of, other, of your Christian friends. You're going to stop going to church. You'll find some excuse not to show up to the Bible study. You'll find some reason not to have fellowship like you once had with other brethren. Yeah, come on. That's 
you'll find any reason at all to justify it. It's amazing what people uh, are able to justify in their own minds. Right. You can justify anything. Yeah. Yeah. We always want to compare ourselves to somebody who's worse. Well, I'm not as bad as that guy. We always compare ourselves to someone who's far worse, we think, than we are, so it makes us look good by comparison. Yeah. We never compare ourselves to someone who's better than us and, show, and to show how rotten we really are. But the infestation of the moths uh, don't want to be scattered, and the sinner doesn't want to be found out. And I'm talking about a Christian, a saved person, who's engaged in sin. He doesn't want to be found out either. But uh, they both can do their work quietly and in secret. If you're a true believer, uh, but you quit reading your Bible, you stay away from Christians and fellowship, and think prayer isn't that essential, eventually you become a worthless Christian. That's what you become. An unproductive, unfruitful, worthless Christian. Uh, I don't want to be an embarrassment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to bring shame to the name and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ or the God who saved me and uh, guarantees my place in heaven one day. Why would, a, why would any Christian want to live a, a life that's unproductive and unfruitful and gives nothing back to the one who saves him and writes his name in heaven and guarantees eternal life to him? And puts the Holy Spirit within him and gives him a conscience now to understand the scriptures that he couldn't understand before. But um, how much time do you spend on the internet? How much time do you spend watching television? How much time do men waste worrying about sports or people worrying about politics? I like what Jay Leno said years ago about politics. He said, they define the word politics, comes from two root words. Poly, which means many, and ticks, which are bloodsuckers. <laughs> That's a pretty good way of defining it. But those things will gradually make you weak as a Christian. Thirdly, let me say this. It's related. The moth works from the inside out. As the worms, the larvae are laid, they begin to grow. Eventually, the, the full-grown moth is gone, but by that time, the coat is ruined. I had a, my wife bought me a nice top coat about 12 years ago. But the weather here in Southern California is not cold enough to really need it. I'd wear it maybe one day a year, and by 10 o'clock in the morning I'd taken it off because the weather is too warm. So I hadn't, and in fact I wore it so seldom people would compliment me thinking it was brand new. Last time I went to wear it, maybe a year ago, two years ago, the moths had gotten to it. There were holes in the fabric. It was the best coat I had, but it had been worn, and but they had destroyed it. They ruined it. The moths were gone, but the holes remained. And after Job's friends gave him uh, their opinions about his troubles, he said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Job 16, verse 2. The people who give you bad advice, the people who get you into trouble, those people are going to be gone when the problems arise. You'll be left alone with all the bad decisions you made. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Mark 7, verses 21 to 23. All of these things grow inwardly before they manifest outwardly. Like the moth that's busy destroying your clothing until it's too late. Fourthly, let me say this today. The moth is no respecter of persons. The moth is no respecter of persons. The moth won't pass over an expensive sweater or a cardigan, you know, when he's dry clean only uh, items uh, in favor of a, you know, cheap flannel pajamas. A smelly garment, a sweaty garment is a sweaty garment to a moth. And uh, this is also true of sin. 
and temptation. No amount of money, no amount of education, no amount of achievement can safeguard you from the weaknesses of your own flesh. It's true. There should be a hundred amens in this room here. But no amount of achievement and success and status in the world can protect you from the weaknesses of your own flesh and temptation. Amen. The nature of lust and envy is just as strong in a, a rich man as it is in a poor man. The moth destroys the fiber in a fabric. And, since, uh, and a sin has often destroyed the best minds, the best talents, the best um, reputations, the best testimonies, the best families. People with great potential have been ruined because they fell prey and victim to sin. And um, the Bible says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. But when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1, 14 and 15. All the money in the world, all the money in the kingdom, couldn't protect Solomon from wanting to collect more women and wives and concubines. Just satisfy his own lust. He couldn't get enough. And after setting such a bad example as a king and as a father, he writes to his son Rehoboam, Proverbs chapter 7, to not go out there and fool around with uh, fornication prostitutes. Read Proverbs 7. That's the advice he had to give his son because he had set a bad example. All the wealth, all the education, all the uh, authority and clout that royal family might have had was no safeguard, was no protection against the weaknesses of sin and temptation that come along. As a matter of fact, people who have a lot think that they're entitled to sin. A little bit more than some folks with less. They think, I've, I've achieved something. I've got money. I've got status. I've got friends. I have a good job. I have a good position. I have a good income. And uh, therefore, I can get away with what I want to get away with. And you can't tell me it's wrong. That's, that's the arrogance. That's the, the, the pride of the carnal nature. And the carnal nature is alive in every living Christ, Christian. There are two natures at war with each other. There's the old nature that wants to satisfy itself and cut corners and cheat and get away with something and do those things which are displeasing in the eyes of a holy God. And then there's the new nature that's been regenerated by the power of the Holy Ghost that wants to please God and wants to do, be noble and wants to uh, uh, do those things which would be right in the eyes of a holy God. And there's this constant struggle going on between those two natures. And uh, just a side note, the modern psychology, a lot of modern philosophy, emphasizes these two natures. You have a spiritual nature and you have a fleshly nature. And they all, they, all they ever talk about these two. But they forget there's a third nature in the middle. That's called the soul. And it's that third nature that is weighing the options and deciding which direction do I go in. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God, the Bible says. That old illustration of uh, two dogs, the, whichever one you feed is the one that's going to get stronger and healthier. The one you starve will be the one that gets sickly and dies. And in a sense, that's what you want to do with the, the carnal, fleshly, uh, self-serving, self-satisfying nature of your flesh. But uh, wealth and education and status are no safeguards against your own temptations. Whether you're rich or poor, the moth is no respecter of persons. How many good Christians thought they could live a secret life, get away with their sins, maybe the brethren wouldn't find out, everything would be okay, and they'd stop just before it got too bad or went too far? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17 says, Now, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Romans 14, verse 7 says, For, uh, but none, for none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Everything you do has an effect 
good or bad, on the reputation and the testimony of other Christians. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Excuse me. That verse was profound in my thinking this last week with all the good emails I was getting from people. Your life is, as a Christian is to be a help and an encouragement and a minister and a brother or a sister in prayer and uh, to another Christian who may be struggling uh, and encourage them not to sin and they encourage you not to sin and you draw strength from one another. There's a famous poet, British poet named John Donne, who said, No man is an island. The death of every man lessens me. That's even more true in the words of the Apostle Paul when he says, For none of us Christians liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Your life is bound with the lives of other Christians, and theirs with you. You don't want to do things that would bring shame to them or damage their reputation. Their, listen, Living a, a faithful, consistent life as a Christian in this world is tough enough without the brethren doing some stupid thing to ruin your, your larger testimony as a group or as a church or a congregation. But the moth, just like sin, is no respecter of persons. And fifthly, lastly today, there is a solution for the moth. Some women have put their expensive clothes in a, a cedar wood chest, thinking the smell will drive away the moths. And I like the smell of the wood, but it's a little overpowering at times. And I don't even know if that uh, approach ever worked. Some people put expensive clothes, pack them in moth balls that have been made to drive off the insect. But the chemicals in those moth balls smell horrid. They're terrible. Regular vacuuming of your carpets and your drapes can sometimes keep the larva or the eggs from being laid and settling in the house. The best solution seems to be to keep your clothes worn, used, and frequently washed. Now, let me see if I can make a spiritual application of that. If you're living for the service of Jesus Christ, you won't have time to be getting in trouble, right? If you're reading your Bible, your thought life is going to be different. If you're praying for the brethren, your burdens and your convictions, those things that are more important, most important to you, will become clearer. And if you've got the interests of other Christians at heart and their concerns, their needs uh, in mind, It'll get you off of yourself. You won't be thinking of yourself and what you want, what you want to do, what you want to get away with. It'll change you. So get busy trying to do something for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Romans 13, verse 14. Paul also writes that ye put off Concerning the former lusts, excuse me, the former conversation, the old man, uh, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24. Like taking off your dirty clothes when you take a shower and changing. That's a trick young men try to pull. Young men will try to put on the same dirty t-shirt after they take a shower, right? Girls don't really do that, but for some reason, boys, ah, it's going to be okay. But if, you, if you're honest with yourself, after you've waited three weeks to finally take that shower, you know, young man, you get, <laughs> you get washed up, get cleaned up, and suddenly that t-shirt doesn't smell so good after all. Because the change has taken place in you. And once you are made clean from sin, why wouldn't you want to keep the rest of your life clean from sin as much as you can, as often as you can, as vigorously as you can, 
uh, every day, every night. You should start your day with prayer. You should start your day in the Word of God. When you go to work, don't get out of your car and go into the building till you pray again. Pray for your boss. Pray for people you work for. It'll change the way you think about them. You won't get, you won't grumble and be mad and angry. Well, that guy treats me poorly. And start praying for that person as a man or a woman who is lost. They need Jesus Christ. It'll change the way you think. Someone said to me earlier this week um, that uh, it's not, some Calvinists, the prayer doesn't change things. It just changes people. Well, uh, if it doesn't change things, then why does God ask us to pray? If there's nothing to be changed, why would we pray at all? Right. But it is true, it does change you. It is true, it does change you. But it also changes the circumstances. The Bible says, yet ye have not because ye ask not. So it doesn't, never hurts to ask. But you don't want your life to become a moth-eaten garment because of sin. And I'm going to close it right there. But the moth is a picture of sin. It's small, it's little, it works quietly, it works in secret. It's no respecter of persons. And there's really only one successful way to deal with the problem. That is a life, a consistent life given to Jesus Christ and living for Jesus Christ.